Well, good evening. Thanks for joining us for our Wednesday night service. Just as a reminder, we're very excited about uh, coming up on February the 7th. Our Sunday morning schedule will change from the way we have been meeting. Uh, we'll have Sunday school at 915 and then at 1030, uh, two worship services, one mask required in the gym, one mask suggested or encouraged in the worship center. There'll be live music in uh, both and live uh, preaching. We'll rotate the pastors back and forth over the coming weeks as we'll be launching a new series. And we hope that uh, you can find a way to increasingly be more plugged into our church. We just continue to pray for the uh, virus to begin to diminish with the spread of the vaccines and uh, ask you to be in prayer as we continue to try to make good decisions in seeking to move forward. The topic of thankfulness is one that is often relegated to discussion one time per year in the life of the church, and yet it should not be. It is a theme we should visit often, and in those visits we should remind ourselves of how vital it is to live a thankful life. Being thankful, however, means different things to different people. That is, we may be thankful over different types of things from one another. Some people are thankful over unusual circumstances or even objects. There was a Bible study teacher of children once that discovered this reality when she was teaching uh, kids on a particular Sunday. She asked the kids in her class to talk about that for which they were thankful. And one little boy said he was thankful for his glasses. And the teacher asked him, why are you thankful for your glasses? Because she knew how much little boys often hate wearing glasses. Without hesitating, he said, because they keep the boys from fighting me and the girls from kissing me. Well, at times, two people can look at the same situation and one can find reason to give thanks while the other complains. William Parks used to say to his students at Northfield, Massachusetts, two girls gather grapes. One is happy because they found the grapes. The other is unhappy because the grapes have seeds. Two women examine a bush. One is unhappy because the bush has thorns, but the other notices the roses and is overjoyed with their fragrance. Thankfulness then is often driven in the world by perceptions, by how we tend to look at situations. Unfortunately, as I said in the beginning, in our culture, attention to thankfulness itself is given a short window of focus each year, usually at Thanksgiving, the time to give thanks or count your blessings, etc. And even then, it is often reduced to a short prayer said before a great meal, a prayer that is soon forgotten in the midst of sports and shopping. And I say this is unfortunate because from a Christian perspective, Thanksgiving is a much deeper issue than a once a year observance. For us, Thanksgiving should be a way of life. We should learn to live a thankful life, which is the title of the message for this evening. So tonight, I want us to take some time to visit this topic of living a thankful life as we're early in a new year. Perhaps this is a message that can guide us through this year, flowing out of a difficult year into living with Thanksgiving no matter what the circumstances, no matter how this year unfolds. Our text for tonight is found in Psalm 136, and I'll read the entire psalm. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. His love endures forever. To Him who alone does great wonders, His love endures forever. Who by His understanding made the heavens, His love endures forever who spread out the earth upon the waters. His love endures forever. Who made the great lights? His love endures forever. The sun to govern the day. His love endures forever. The moon and stars to govern the night. His love endures forever. To him who struck down the firstborn of Egypt, his love endures forever. And brought Israel out from among them, his love endures forever. With a mighty hand and outstretched arm, His love endures forever. To Him who divided the Red Sea asunder, His love endures forever. And brought Israel through the midst of it, His love endures forever. But swept Pharaoh and his army into the Red Sea, His love endures forever. To Him who led His people through the wilderness, His love endures forever. To Him who struck down great kings, his love endures forever and killed mighty kings. His love endures forever. Sihon, king of the Amorites, his love endures forever. And Og, king of Bashan, his love endures forever. 
and gave their land as an inheritance. His love endures forever. An inheritance to his servant Israel. His love endures forever. He remembered us in our low estate. His love endures forever. And freed us from our enemies. His love endures forever. He gives food to every creature. His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of heaven. His love endures forever. And Father, we thank you that indeed your love does endure forever for your people. We pray, Lord, that you would help us in this uh, message to live a life of thanksgiving in light of the one we serve. We pray this in your name. Amen. Well, tonight, we're going to draw upon this psalm as sort of a background and develop this topic of thanksgiving along Two broad lines, just a brief devotional message, nothing exhaustive on this subject. But I do pray you'll spend some time with this psalm in the coming days and some time thinking more about living a life of thanks. First of all, as we uh, look at the text and what we find here, we find a theme here that we're to live a thankful life, giving thanks perpetually, focusing on the giver of the gift rather than the gift or the blessing itself. So as we think about thanksgiving, it's to be something that uh, we are to focus upon the Lord and we're to do it all the time. We're to be able to, to live a life perpetually giving thanks. And so it is unfortunate again that for many, thanksgiving is reduced to a once a year observance and then perhaps giving thanks or saying grace or the blessing as we call it in the South before our meals as we go throughout the year. But again, the theme of thanksgiving is long and deep in the Bible. <clears throat> and so it is, as we say here in our first point, perpetual. And to give us some examples of that, we can think of things like this. The Apostle Paul in every one of his epistles uh, or letters outside of 2 Corinthians, he begins somewhere in the opening verses with words about giving thank, thanksgiving or he's giving thanksgiving. Jesus, as we interact with him in the Gospels, is recurringly displaying a heart of gratitude and dependence toward the Father over and over again in the worship of God in the Bible, like in this psalm. We see it as tied to the theme of thanksgiving. The scripture also reminds us that our prayer lives, both public and private, should be rooted in a spirit of perpetual thanksgiving. And so Paul says in Philippians 4, 6, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation. So that's something we're facing all the time, it's life. In every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And then in relationship to public worship, we read texts like Psalm 100 verse 4, where the psalmist says, Enter his gates with thanksgiving, and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. So privately, publicly, we're perpetually living in a spirit of thanksgiving. The Lord's Supper itself is a regular practice called for by Jesus for his disciples to observe. And it is in one sense rooted in thanksgiving. Some Christian groups refer to it as the Eucharist, which is the Greek word for it, growing out of thanksgiving, rooted in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty four, 24, where Paul writes, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. So ultimately, as followers of Jesus, we're called by God to give thanks through faith in all of life's circumstances perpetually. Thus, the Apostle Paul put it this way in 1 Thessalonians 5.18, when he said, give thanks in all circumstances. That's a very broad application, isn't it? And so thanksgiving is to be then perpetual. Now, I read that a uh, man named Fulton uh, Ausler learned this lesson from a black lady who helped take care of him when he was a little boy. And she took care of him. He observed her. And every time she sat down to eat, she bowed her head and said, much obliged, Lord. Ausler asked her why she did this. So the food was there for her to enjoy, whether she gave thanks or not. And she replied to him by saying this, sure, we get our victuals or our food, but it makes everything taste better to be grateful. Many years later, Ausler stood at the bedside of that same dear woman as she lay dying. And seeing her in much pain, he wondered if she still could find something to be grateful for. And just then she opened her eyes. And when she saw him and the others gathered around her, she folded her hands and said with a smile, Much obliged, Lord, 
for such fine friends. But remember, we said that beyond Thanksgiving being perpetual, it is also to be something in which we focus on the giver rather than the gift. In our normal practices in giving thanks in our culture, people often focus not on the giver, but rather they focus on the gift. They, uh, and so we are called though to, to focus more on the uh, provider, play it this way, rather than the provision, but it's usually the other way around. And if you only give thanks occasionally, <clears throat> that will be your tendency to focus on the gift, not the giver, on the provision rather than the provider. But looking in scripture, however, we see that giving thanks often falls into the pattern of first focusing on God as a person before focusing on what God does. And so just invite you, if you would, to look at a few scriptures with me. Go back to that first one of Psalm 136. Give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. And so His, His love endures forever. Give thanks to the God of gods. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. It's, it begins focusing on the person here. Or if we look in Psalm 118, in verse 1, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. Same phraseology, His love endures forever. Or down in verse 29, again, give thanks to the Lord, for He is good. His love endures forever. Or if we go back a bit more to Psalm 100, verses 4 and 5, where we read about worship. Enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him and praise His name, for the Lord is good. And his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. And then one other in Revelation chapter 11, which uh, verses 16 and 17, which I think is the last reference in the Bible related to giving thanksgiving. And then one other passage in Revelation chapter 11, verses 16 and 17, which I think is the last reference to thanksgiving in the scripture we read, And the 24 elders who were seated on their thrones before God fell on their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, the one who is and who was, because you've taken your great power and have begun to reign. And so you see here that the focus is on the person of the Lord. And again, back to our passage tonight. Just to remind you that before any of the acts are mentioned, and he goes through a litany of God's working in the nation of Israel throughout their history. But you'll notice back in our text in the psalm that we read earlier, Psalm 136, again, it focuses on him before any acts are mentioned. So give thanks to the Lord. He is good. Give thanks to the God of gods because he's the ruler. Give thanks to the Lord of lords. He is the supreme one. And so we see here the, the, the themes of his goodness, his love, his power, his character stands before all of his actions. So we as believers must learn then, I think, to emulate this pattern if we're going to live a life of thanks in a proper way. That is, we must follow this pattern we find in the Word of God. We're to focus first perpetually as well on who he is and learn to express thanks to Him for the awesome fact that He is God alone. There are no other gods. He is beautiful and glorious in His character and all His other perfections to be totally satisfied in God. And if we will grow to be focused like that, focus first on the person rather than the provision, the Creator rather than the creation, on God rather than self, it will radically alter our worlds. You know, the attitude and approach of which I'm speaking is uh, demonstrated well by the one leper who returned to thank Jesus for healing him. You remember that in Luke 17, verses 11 through 19, we read these words. Now, on his way to Jerusalem, Jesus traveled along the border between Samaria and Galilee. As he was going into a village... Ten men who had leprosy met him. They stood at a distance and called out in a loud voice, Jesus, Master, have pity on us. When he saw them, he said, Go show yourselves to the priest. And as they went, they were cleansed. And one of them, when he saw he was healed, came back praising God in a loud voice. He threw himself at Jesus' feet and thanked him. And he was a Samaritan. 
Jesus asked, were not all ten cleansed? Where are the other nine? Has no one returned to give praise to God except this foreigner? Then he said to them, rise and go. Your faith has made you well. But notice he came back to give thanks to the Lord as the Lord. He fell at his feet in worship. That is, he was worshiping the person of Christ more so than his healing. Let me ask you, Tonight is your life lived in that fashion in light of God's grace to give you life and eternal life. If you're a believer that you've received the greatest gift of eternal life from this great God, the God that we should worship. You know, if we're not careful, the tendency we have is to focus on ourselves rather than the Savior, even when giving thanks. I just want to challenge all of us to focus our lives then on the God who has given us all things perpetually keeping him at the center. It is a fine line. But if we will deliberately focus in that particular way, concentrate to keep the right order, then that will help us live the proper life of thanks and help us along the way in uh, having a life of of joyful uh, thanks to the Lord. And then secondly, uh, tonight, um, living a life of thanks ultimately leads us into concrete actions. If you're really living a thankful life, it's going to change the way that you live. And so this is the second trail that I invite you to walk down with me tonight as we look at this topic of thanksgiving, living a thankful life. It is more than an expression of words, but rather it leads to concrete, real actions. You know, we do not have to look long in the Word of God to find that people who are truly thankful They become people whose lives take on a different character. The text we have read for background tonight recounts reasons to give thanks, focusing on the Lord and what He has done. But if a person truly has a thankful heart, in the broader view of Scripture as well, it affects how he or she lives. So, for example, we can think of Zacchaeus in the New Testament, the small little miser, tax collector, cheat, tax cheat. He cheated people. And he led others to do so. But when he turned to the Lord and his heart was changed and filled with thanks, his inclination was to act. His inclination was to give his wealth away and to restore what he had taken. Or when we think of the Philippian jailer in the book of Acts, when he was saved and filled with joy, it led him to wash the wounds of Paul and Silas. And that trait is one that came to mark Christians and the whole Christian movement. They were thankful people for the grace of God, knowing God as their personal father now. They were filled with joy. And then they concretely ministered to one another and even to their pagan neighbors. And so listen, when we are living a life of thanks, focusing on the Lord himself first, We cannot help but become persons whose actions, character, and lifestyles are altered. To say we're thankful and never act upon that or for um, or, or move upon that or never to alter our lives in any way is the height of hypocrisy. And so, you know, there's several ways a thankful heart will alter our actions in reality. Let me share a few of these with you before we wrap up for tonight. One thing that will happen in our lives if we truly um, know the Lord and we are focusing on Him and uh, being thankful for who He is and also for what He has done, perpetually living in this way in the right order, it's going to lead us uh, toward uh, a life of holiness. And so Paul writes in Ephesians 5, 3 through 7, He says, but among you, there must not be even a hint of sexual immorality or of any kind of impurity or of greed, because these are improper for God's holy people, nor should there be obscenity, foolish talk or coarse joking, which are out of place, but listen, rather thanksgiving. For of this you can be sure no immoral, impure, or greedy person, such a person as an idolater, has any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ and of God. Let no one deceive you with empty words, for because of such things God's wrath comes on those who are disobedient. Therefore, do not be partners with them. But I want you to notice right in this text, 
on living our lives as believers differently than the world, living in holiness. Thankful living is contrasted here with sinful living. So I think we can say that when we are living a thankful life focused upon Him, we can begin to dislodge the rot of fallenness in our lives. It's the same principle the Apostle Paul lays out as well in the letter to the Philippians in chapter 4 in verse 6 where he says, Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your requests to God and the peace of God which transcends all understanding will guard our hearts, uh, guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. That is that as we live with this type of thing, it's going to give us power as we present our request with thanksgiving to God that we know, the one that we trust in his character, is going to lead to changes in our lives uh, here in the sense that uh, it will move into improving even our mental state, dealing with our anxiety. And so when we live lives of perpetual thankfulness and we allow that focus to drive us to concrete action, it will do something deep in us, deep in our hearts and our minds and our souls and our wills. It will change our lives and lift up our countenance. For many, it could perhaps be a cure or part of a cure for a life that has a lot of depression and melancholy. You know, we can see this change expressed well in literature in the story of Scrooge and Dickens' A Christmas Carol. When uh, life took on new meaning for him, when he became thankful and it changed his countenance, everything about him. I want to share a little story with you from Norman Vincent Peale. I'm not a, a real fan of Norman Vincent Peale, but pretty good story here. He told about a man by the name of William Stidger. He said he was on the verge of a nervous breakdown. He said the man had a very vital, dynamic person, a personality, but he'd become an empty shell of his old self. A friend suggested the way for him to avoid further breakdown and be healed was by the therapy of thanksgiving and by the practice of what is called the attitude of gratitude. His friend advised Stidger to sit down and to make a list of all the people who had helped him through the years. Then he was to fill his mind with thankfulness for all these and for all they had done for him. His friend asked if he had ever thanked anybody. No, he said, I never really made much stress on that. Next, his friend advised him to think of someone who especially had blessed his life and to write that person a letter thanking him or her. And he, he thought of an old school teacher that he'd had who was now very old. So Stidger sat down and wrote her a letter telling her that he remembered the inspiration she'd given him, how he'd never forgotten her across the years, how much he loved her. And a few days later, he received a letter back from her written in a trembling hand. You can see it on the page. And using his boyhood name, it said, Dear Willie, when I think back, over all the children I've taught in my lifetime, you're the only one who ever wrote to thank me for what I did as a teacher. You've made me so happy. I read your letter through my tears. I have it by my bedside and I read it every night. I shall cherish your letter until the day I die. Well, you know, this did so much for William Stidger that he thought of someone else to write. And then someone else, before he was through, uh, he had written 500 unexpected letters of thanks, and this therapy of giving a, becoming a person of thanksgiving lifted him out of his depression. Now again, I think we must get this in the right order, that we're perpetually giving thanks, first of all, to the Lord for who He is, and then what He has done. We live in a spirit of thanksgiving because of the grace of God seen in our lives. But then also it does lead to concrete actions. And those concrete actions as we live for the Lord will lead us toward holiness and lead us toward being lifted up in our countenance and in our spirit as we begin to pour out our lives in service to others. And so our thanksgiving spreads from thanking the Lord to thanking others, serving others. And that would just be a, a great uh, uh, perhaps healing moment, a growth moment in our lives. And then, you know, over time as we live in this way, we're going to grow to know the Lord better. And when we get to that point, as we continue to grow in our love for Him, our relationship deepening with Him, our commitment to Him deepening, it's going to grow us even more 
uh, in our lives and our devotion, love to the Lord and just uh, being able to, to manage life here with, with its difficulties, even in, in a spirit of, of joy and thankfulness. I, I'm reminded of the woman uh, who uh, anointed Jesus in Luke 7, 41 through 48. And uh, people kind of get on to him for, for this woman who's touching him, that she is a sinner. And so Jesus uh, speaks to Simon. He was in this home of a Pharisee named Simon. And he, he says, tell me, teacher. He says, two people owed money to a certain money lender. One owed him 500 denarii and the other 50. Neither of them had the money to pay him back, so he forgave the debts of both. Now, which of them will love him more? And Simon replied, I suppose the one who had the bigger debt forgiven. You've judged correctly, Jesus said. Then he turned toward the woman and said to Simon, do you see this woman? I came into your house. You did not give me any water for my feet, but she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You did not give me a kiss, but this woman from the time I entered has not stopped kissing my feet. You did not put oil on my head, but she has poured perfume on my feet. Therefore, I tell you, her many sins have been forgiven as her great love has shown. But whoever has been forgiven little loves little. And so she was truly thankful to the Lord for forgiving her. First of all, she was thankful for him and then for what he had done. And it led to concrete action and worship toward him, deeper love for him than the others around her who should have also been at his feet but were not. And that type of a heart of joyful thanksgiving, even when mixed with tears, as hers was here, it will lead us to touch others in the world around us. That is a pattern of truly living a thankful life. And that is a pattern that we should seek to emulate in our lives as disciples of Jesus. May we pray. Father, we thank you for uh, the theme of thanksgiving that we find in the Word of God. And Lord, I just pray you bless this little devotion tonight. Uh, Lord, in seeking to make application of these thoughts, that Lord, we would... Um, Learn to live a life of perpetual thanksgiving, focusing first on you, the giver rather than the gift, focusing on your character, on your grace, on your mercy, on who you are, and then, Lord, being thankful for what you have done for us. We pray that, Lord, as we do that, our love for you will grow. Our hearts will be filled with, Lord, the fruit of the Spirit, uh, and Lord, that we will be thankful in such a way that uh, our personal walk, our lives are changed. Uh, Lord, as we move from living in darkness uh, to light, rooting out that old pattern as we embrace the new with thankfulness, as Paul says in Ephesians. And then out of that, Lord, that it will lead to concrete acts as well toward others, that we will pour out our lives, blessing other people as you have blessed us, Lord. And that as we live in that way, we just pray, Lord, that we would be filled with joy, that our countenances would be lifted up, that we would overcome, Lord, those uh, times of where we get inwardly focused as uh, William Stidger did and we get down, that, Lord, we would be people who are full of joy as we pour our lives uh, upon others in response to how you poured yourself out in your grace and mercy upon us because you're so good and because your love endures forever. Bless us now as we part. Give us a great rest of the week, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.